welcome to the Dividend Cafe podcast and video. Uh, I am in the California studio uh, because I got back in the middle of the night from New York, and I'm going to start off my comments today with a little explanation as to how I ended up into this topic and the direction I'm going to go with what I want to talk to you all about today. I um, had intended uh, kind of interesting. I had about four or five different topics I was going to weave together. I had a number of white papers I'd read this week, and there was a research project I'd done. And I thought I had kind of all Friday morning, as I normally do in New York City, to wrap all this up. And then something came up where I needed to be in California here today. And so I ended up getting the last flight out last night from JFK and getting back in the middle of the night, like I said. Well, that's fine in and of itself because I can get a lot of work done, both reading and writing on an airplane. Um, but what kind of screwed everything up is, first of all, topically, uh, the the market, which had been up 300 points on Wednesday and was kind of flattish, um, uh, Thursday all of a sudden dropped in about 30 minutes yesterday, 300 points, which really, quite honestly, is not that big of a deal at all. But the, but the event-driven nature of it around the Biden administration announcing um, a capital gain tax increase, I felt like, okay, that's something I'd kind of like to address and in, in Divin Cafe. And so it caused me to sort of rethink what I was going to do with some of the other material. And and then it, my scheduling and timings all changed because of our, you know, press schedule and me flying and when I needed to write and all the things. And then I, um, and for those of you who read DC Today, you may have heard about this on Thursday, but I all of a sudden got to Admiral's Club on Thursday late afternoon and my T button on my keyboard was just completely totally broken and so you know kind of can't really type that way and so just through a combination of things over the last uh what is it now um I guess uh 18 hours I pulled it all together and found the topic I wanted to talk about to you and that's what I'm about to do we got our written dividend cafe done a lot of charts in it all came together. It just ended up being written on about five different devices instead of the one device I normally write it on. Um, let me start. Basically, what I'm I'm kind of titling this talk today is what me worry, meaning a few different things that you could see prima facie why someone may, in my shoes, want to worry about it and why I'm not actually worried and, and, and at least not in a, in a panic type context. But the, I want to explain where there is bad news and and also where there is even worse news than people really understand in a generational or long-term sense on a separate issue that we never talk about, but that in a shorter-term sense, the, the issue that kind of took over uh, Thursday may need a little better explanation. Let's start with the capital gain deal. It's kind of boring if all I do is say, well, yes, it would be bad, but it's not going to happen. And I can tell you that sometimes, like on Fox, when they invite me to come on and talk about this, and they say, what's your perspective? And I say, I'm not worried about such and such because it's never going to happen. They they say, okay, well, we want you to talk about it like as if it were going to happen. You know, I think that's better for ratings. And also, I do think there's some people that would like to engage the issue outside of the, it will never happen, but into the hypothetical as, it, as to if it were. And so I did uh, an appearance of Charles Payne this week, who's a good friend of mine, and I love Charles, but in, in you know his question it was, never mind if this isn't going to happen, and he was talking about um, free college for all, which was, is a Bernie Sanders proposal that he's bringing to the United States Senate. And, and my response of, that's never going to get passed, was like, okay, well, what, come on, let's have the conversation. And so I get it. And, and I actually think that's an important conversation to have so that we do have a sort of topical and policy understanding around some of the issues, even if they're not necessarily politically feasible. By the way, it sure seems to me some things that one day are not politically feasible become politically feasible down the line. And I'm sure on either side of the aisle, people can think about examples of that that have proven to be true in recent memory. But um, the the issue with the capital gain tax, one of the things that upsets me about the subject is that I think it's a very bad idea and has a, a negative impact to markets. And yet I think it's actually for a very different reason than most of the opponents of raising taxes on capital gains are 
uh, understanding. And it may be that they are understanding it, but they're not articulating it that way. So yes, I will just give you the basic caveat. I don't think it's going to happen. What he's proposing is to raise the capital gain rate, which right now is 15% on the first 450000 for married couple, and then 20% beyond that, for people over a million of income, to um, raise it to 39.6%, and to keep the 3.8% Obamacare surtax, um, which kicks in at 250000 So you're really talking about, I think it's a 43 point um four percent marginal tax on capital gains for high the high earners and then if they're in a high state a high tax state generally capital gains are taxed at ordinary state income rates you're really talking about 56 percent in california you're talking about 55 percent in new york when you combine state and federal and for other higher tax states, Connecticut, New Jersey, Michigan, Illinois, you know, you're, you're above 50% into the mid 50s. So it's highly progressive. There's some people that think it's a great idea. There is all the normal politics and class warfare and arguments for, arguments against. That, that's, that is what it is. I don't believe that they're going to be able to get it through the Senate. I also don't think they're going to be able to get it through the House. So, so I've told you I'm going to kind of push it beyond that. The other piece as far as how it affects the overall stock market is just understanding the democratization of, uh, and the allocation of stock market ownership. Okay, I put a chart in Dividend Cafe this week, and I actually got it from Axios, which I was surprised that they had covered this. It's over $33 trillion of ownership in the stock market, uh, well, of total assets in, that belong to retirement accounts, IRAs. 401ks, pension funds, uh, defined contribution accounts, um, annuities, things that are, are tax-deferred type vehicles that therefore are, are not subject to any impact from capital gain ownership. So I certainly believe on the margin that an increase in capital gain taxation is negative to the valuation of risk assets. But I think that part of the issue, besides the fact that it's going to be an uphill battle to get it done, is that it is not a broad brush, holistic increase, although it is severely punitive to those that are directly hit by it, those high earners, particularly in, in higher tax states, et cetera. But I think this misses the mark. I think the biggest impact to the economy and to the stock market if we were to see such a, a, a thing embraced, is, pardon the expression, but the trickle-down impact to capital allocation. The impact it would have on capital formation is, I think, really, really underappreciated. And I mean that in the most negative way I possibly can. People saying, okay, I kind of want to sell this uh, building this business, this stock, this investment, it's run its course, it's given me the return I wanted, there's a new opportunity I want to invest in, oh, but you know what, if I sell, I got to pay 50 cents on the dollar in taxes, I'm just going to hold it. It's rational thinking and the way people view their own balance sheets, they have on paper that they have X and if they sell, they're going to have less than X because taxes will take away some part of the value of X. So then there's a cost benefits analysis that gets done where, okay, well, I want to sell it. I want to sell it badly enough that I'm willing to pay 20% of that value's gain uh, in, in taxes, but not bad, badly enough to pay this higher amount, right? So it becomes a marginal decision in all economics, always and forever is marginal. Um, I think that you get really, really poor decisions about capital allocation that have a heavy bias towards stale assets when you have a higher tax on capital. People hold assets that they otherwise wouldn't hold, which is distortive to rational economic decision making. Then they don't have those proceeds from the gain they otherwise would have incurred to invest in new projects, new capital deployment that represents a more productive 
allocation of resources. This is the problem. It is not just that um, the value of XYZ stock is technically less because at the gain realization point, there will be less dollars you get to keep from it. That's true. As I've already tried to say, that's actually somewhat limited in its scope. But to the extent that this has a broader spreading of the decision-making that takes place around capital allocation, I think that is the issue. So we're going to watch it closely politically. I don't think Senator Manchin in West Virginia or Cinema in Arizona, and there may be others too, are going to bend on this. I think that they'll they'll compromise and 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 turn it down a bit, similar to what appears to be happening on the corporate tax side. But who knows? Maybe you know politics is a horse trading kind of sausage making business, and maybe. They throw a bone to them saying, we're going to do this in the bill you want, and we're going to do this you want, and we're going to give this in your state, and then we want your vote on this. And, and they come around. You know, I, I, I can't say for certain, um, but I think that right now, first of all, it is absolutely not a surprise. This was on the web page of the Biden campaign all of last year. Um, he has repeated it since becoming president over 30 times. This was the intent. And it's a starting spot, and I don't think it's going to go as is, and that's my, you know, feeling about where we are with it. Um, now, I mentioned that there's something out there that I would be more concerned about, and because it teed up for me a chance to do what I love doing most of Dividend Cafe, which is sort of give a little economics tutorial, I want to share with you something about, um, it's not just merely demographics, it is specific to population growth. You know, there are only two ways to grow population in a country, and that is new births and new immigration. And if you know of another way that I don't know of, then let me know. You know, uh, I prefer you not come back with something about, you know, factory uh, uh, or laboratory uh, uh, manufacturing or something. You know, look, it's pretty obvious that either new people are coming into your country from outside the country or new people being born in your country, or your country isn't growing its headcount, so to speak. And then furthermore, to the extent that we still obviously suffer from the, on this side of glory, the painful reality of death, the deaths that take place throughout a year in a country have to be offset by the births that take place for there to just be a break even in population. And, and so when you get uh, downward pressure on the total level of immigration, which we've had for some time, for a variety of reasons, mostly political, some cultural, some bipartisan, and I won't get into all the details around it. I wrote a whole chapter on my feelings on the immigration debate in my book, Crisis of Responsibility. And my, my views on it are, are not really totally partisan with one side or the other. I, I, I think I pretty well have views that manage to upset everybody, um, which is usually, I think, probably a pretty good thing. But regardless, I'm just talking math here. Um, this is an economic truism that I want you to remember. And it is not controversial. It's not disputed. But economic growth is population growth plus productivity. And to the extent you have a declining population and let's assume level productivity, you're going to have less economic growth because you know, of math. And if you have a higher population and level productivity, you're getting more growth. If you have a higher population with more productivity, both, then you're getting even more growth. But we're below trend line growth in our country since the financial crisis. And we're below trendline population growth, and we're below trendline productivity. So I guess it's not that big of a mystery after all. However, when I, you look at the chart that I put at DividendCafe.com today, and you see how much slowing is taking place in population growth in the country, largely because of declining birth rates since the financial crisis, I do think that there is a lot of deferred um, new uh, new babies being born, meaning people having them later in a later stage of their own adulthood than they previously did. And, and yet either way, um, 
we have the, the, the factor that can really throw off population growth is if you have a very aging population where therefore because of just the kind of obvious mortality realities, you have a higher rate of your population dying because of their age. And, and then you don't have as many youngers that are having children that are offsetting that. So your birth rate be, goes below your death rate and you get a declining population. It's a, it's a dynamic that, that Japan has faced. It's a dynamic that Europe has now faced. It's generally um, a decision a society makes to, to have less babies. And America uh, is, is in that space now, not to the degree that Europe is, not to the degree Japan is, and our aging, our average median age of a population is nowhere near where Japan is, which, by the way, just obviously speaks to decisions that their society and our society made a generation or two generations ago, right? We, we have still a massive amount of people in our population that are so-called baby boomers that came about from the post-World War II era of high birth uh, levels, right? So there's a lot of demographic advantages we've had, but they're slowly diminishing. And I am sparing you my social or cultural message around um, family and around the, the idea of robust communities and 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 all the kind of peripheral things that are non-economic. I'd be happy to go into here, but the truth is that I think longer term, you could talk about any tax rate thing or legislation you want. Legislation, executive orders can't sometimes even last um, for a term, let alone you know two congressional terms, two presidential terms. It, it, there's a lot of fickleness and vulnerability in, in the political rant landscape. But these cultural trends, I think, are more important. So I'm watching that carefully. Uh, so I, I also put a chart in, speaking of what me worry about dividends and there's declining amount of dividend generosity coming out of S&P 500 companies. And the point I kind of make is if I could talk my book or be a little self-serving here, this is a very positive thing for someone who is focused on that elite and exclusive and limited and finite amount of companies that share the characteristics of alignment with shareholders, philosophical commitment to dividend growth, um, a income statement and balance sheet that allows for such. So it is true that you were getting annual dividend growth, uh, 5%, 10%, 15% at certain periods out of the S&P in the 90s, uh, coming out of the tech crash, building up into before the financial crisis. And there was even a nice little resurgence of dividend generosity across the S&P in, in like 2013, 14, around that period. Um, but but you really, sick, if you look at the whole entire chart, it's this downward pressure and actually was going down for years of how much dividend growth the S&P was really generating. Um, and then it, it, before it went actually negative last year with COVID. And the negative piece... I think it's like the seventh time the S&P has gone year over year negative in dividend payment since World War II. It doesn't happen a lot. My preference is it happened zero times ever, but it's happened seven times like in 60, 70 years. That's that's livable, but it's it, it it's held up against the simultaneous reality of less pressure existing in corporate uh, boardrooms and, and, and treasure offices to to grow dividends out of the market. And my view is that that makes more valuable strategies that are more committed to such. Now, even across the market, you're getting a lot of companies in the S&P that are raising dividends now this year because they had held them or cut them or suspended them last year. So there's still kind of a base effect that's, that's helping the numbers improve year over year in the S&P 500. But our view would be that when you find these companies that we obsess over, uh, that outside of market distress, outside of what the trend is, outside of what the index is doing, that just simply have that bottom up commitment and capacity around dividend growth, uh, it, one need not be influenced by peers and one need not be discouraged by what others are doing. This is a, a really healthy and positive thing. Likewise, you look at the stock buyback thing. Last year, buybacks dropped like 40-something percent. 
And and it was the easiest thing and the quickest thing, as it always is in times of market distress, for companies to cut back on stock buybacks as a byproduct of protecting uh, cash and and that their capital return that becomes the first sacrificial lamb, and then and then you know things get better and you go okay well they're going to come right back to stock buybacks and and I say you know you're probably right, but the only thing I want to point out is that they're going to be doing that with markets that are 25 percent higher than their pre-pandemic levels. If you find a track record of companies well timing their commitment to stock buybacks, I'd like to see it because I haven't seen it. When companies should most be buying back their own stock are the periods when companies are least able to buy back the stock. It's just a fact. But when you can maintain consistency, stability, and endurance in your dividend payments, I think you have a really healthy scenario for how you monetize shareholders. So uh, I covered a few different topics here. These are a few things that are on my mind. What me worry? No, I'm not worried about any of these things. I wor- I-, I think there's plenty for investors to understand are out there. Um, I have longer term concerns that are more substantial to me than short term transitory concerns. Um, I would very much like to be able to deal with the investment impact of what's happening on Biden tax changes, Biden administration tax plans, but it's very hard to do when you don't know what is going to be really proposed, what's really going to end up being agreed to, what's really going to come out of the, the, the legislative process, um, and, and then what other trade-offs go along with it as well. That's something I did not understand a few weeks ago the way I do now, which is that what the, if they do end up getting a higher marginal rate on corporate taxation, it looks to me like it's going to be very heavily offset by full expensing of R&D, which is supposed to go to amortization. You go, what are you talking about? R&D, amortization? My point is that one hand might be taking, but another hand might be giving altogether, and you get a little more political optics than you really get economic impact and and in that case it could end up being positive to markets not negative so got to watch all of it want to talk about it as intelligently and objectively and thoughtfully as we can and uh you may be worried about things and and if so that's what i'm here for your advisor the bonson group is here to deal with your worry reach out to us anytime and in the meantime have a wonderful weekend and thank you as always for listening to dividend cafe please put us in your podcast feed Subscribe. It helps us, helps you, and we look forward to talking to you again next week at the Dividend Cafe. 